Yes, I was actually going to touch upon that as well. On average, I think uh, Google said an average smartphone user has uh, 35 apps, right? Um, so I'm thinking of the, I mean, if TMI was a problem before COVID, now I think it's like these all day Zoom, all weekend, week, uh, week long, I think fatigue is setting in or has, has set it, right? So on average, if every app wants to be transparent, if every app wants to put forth, hey, this is what we're getting, or even cookies policy, right? I mean, it, it, like, how does the average consumer even deal with that overload, right? So again, uh, Helen, what you were saying about, hey, do we even know what we're opting into? Yeah, I mean, even if every app becomes transparent and try to build trust, it's still too much information, right? So how do you think, I mean, what's the recourse over here? I actually think that there's an opportunity for crowdsourcing in this space. If we take it that we've all got at least 35 apps or an average of it on our phones, it's not likely that we've looked at the T's and C's, but is there an opportunity for a group of people to look at a group of apps on our behalf and to be able to say, you know, this thing, this one piece is a little bit creepy. This other piece is sort of seems like it's standard and you know we've we've talked about having um they've talked about at the federal level sort of having a software bill of materials for applications that are used in the federal supply chain right um and and that seems to be winding its way through but but is there some way of sort of having a good consumer index visual graphic for an application on an app store or the Android store or whatever that sort of says, you know, from a, from a data consumption perspective, this is a high data usage app. That's the model that, that this is what they're in. This has a low data consumption or, or this has really great security practices, this one less so, something like that. I think, I think we're going to need to come up with some industry standards that, that people can trust uh, going back to that. That's how I think we'll get to it. Not that every individual sits and reads every TNC. No one's got time for that. Yeah, it's like the consumer reports for apps. Uh, <laughs> uh, Heather, your thoughts? Yeah, I like I like that idea of having like a graphic of, you know, so making it much easier for people to understand that your data is coming in and, and here is exactly what it is that we do with it. But then I also think about the perspective of, you know, sort of the, the secret sauce to a company or, um, you know, what what is their business model built off of? And some of these companies, their business model is built off of collecting this data and then reselling it or doing something with it by targeting you in, in some way. So if you're putting out there to the end user, this is how we're using your data. Are you also putting out to your competitors how your business operates? Um, so I don't have an answer, but, you know, it's just, it's it's things to think about that there's, you know, there's, there's, there's this side and then there's this side. Um, no answer, but just, you know, you've, you've got to take take both sides into considerations there. So, so Brian, uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot over here saying you mentioned this, this kind of creepiness towards surveillance. And uh, now I'm going to put the software development method methodology, the like DevOps, right? So it's not like, I mean, cars come out at a certain frequency. I can, I can do an assessment. I can give a report out, but the report I put for software is redundant the moment it comes out. So like, who do you trust and how do you even keep up? Yeah, you, you, you made a left turn. I was ready. I, I wanted to go from consumer reports to like, we need a Yelp for app and privacy, security and privacy, right? If we could Yelp that and yeah. crowdsource it to Helen's point. But I think that's the challenge. We, within higher ed, we have this horrible acronym called the HECFAT, the Higher Education Community Vendor Assessment Toolkit that tries to measure sort of the risk. And we're, we're struggling with how we inject privacy into that risk assessment. But as that matures, we're also struggling with how often and how frequent does it have to be updated, right? So it's a snapshot in time. And to Heather's point, uh, vendors that complete it don't, you know, the idea was to have it be publicly available. So not publicly, but shared across all of higher ed. So institutions, whether it's Ohio State or Duke or, uh, you know, UConn could all review it, but there's two sides of that. The vendors don't want it to be necessarily accessible. And how frequently do we have to make sure that it's updated? So. You know, that's why the Yelp model works because it's the last person that sort of had that experience with the app or that restaurant. Um, so, you know, maybe that's our next podcast is we can talk about how we create the, the solution to this problem. Yeah, and again, so coming coming to you, um, Kevin, and this goes back to what you mentioned, especially down your alley, right? You, 
without this digital trail that these criminals leave behind, you guys would have an even harder time. So the question is now, there was this wholesale quote unquote movement from WhatsApp to Signal, except half the people realized that their friends hadn't moved to Signal. So now you have two apps on your phone where you had one previously. So you're leaving twice the amount of digital trails, which is great if you're a criminal and you're a prosecuting attorney, you know that that digital trail is what helps you. Um, so again, going back to the, the ethics and the economics behind it, right? On the one hand, lack of privacy allows you to go chasing these guys. On the other hand, it causes issues with the average citizen because now you have all of this data. So again, how many, where, where does your head stand in all of this? Always, you know, trying to balance things. As we talked about before, any, any exposure anything where we can dig in a little bit more on, and, and I'm not talking about legal process right now. If I can send a search warrant in, I can get a ton of data you know, on a lot of things. You know, if I know how, if I know what to ask for and, and what to do with it when I get it back. But when you think of victims out here, kids, or if you think of domestic violence victims that are being stalked, that that's when you know the, the, the word creepy came up a minute ago. That's when you when you see what they can do with that, especially when you, we haven't even gotten into breach data yet. But there 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 is so much out here that yeah. While on one hand I want to hunt the bad guys and I want it to be easy to hunt them, but you also have to look at the the opposite side of this on victims. What we're doing in a lot of in a lot of ways, we learn from what criminals do. Is they're very innovative, they're very you know forward thinking. So we're always watching to see what they're doing, how they're doing it, and then we'll reverse it on them. But we also want to take that knowledge, and I, I don't want my family being vulnerable. I don't want my friends being vulnerable. So we need to actively teach this as well. That's why I'm a big privacy supporter, a big privacy advocate, because I can't tell you how many victims I have sat with that have been stalked, that have been victimized, elderly. Uh, it, it never ends. So yeah, we, we definitely need a, a balancing act. So whatever it takes to keep people safe, I'm for, we'll always find a way to hunt the bad guys because that's just what we do. 